Um, I'd like to begin, uh, first of all, by acknowledging the traditional owners uh, and custodians of the land on which we're meeting today, uh, the Wurundjeri uh, people of the Kulin Nation, and to pay our respects to the elders past and present, uh, and any elders from the communities who might be uh, here today. So it's a really great pleasure uh, today to introduce uh, Cyril Silliot, who's giving today's seminar. So Cyril completed his PhD in Toulouse in 2011, and after a meeting at one of the Dendrigsel conferences, um, it was agreed that he would move uh, his family, which was quite small at the time, and has expanded since he's been in Australia, uh, to Melbourne to actually work on dendritic cells. Uh, at least that was, the, that was the premise. But quite quickly he became uh, swept up in the excitement of looking at innate lymphoid cells, which was uh, a new area that we were developing in the lab at the time, and uh, has been exceptional in really progressing various aspects of understanding how innate lymphoid cells uh, actually develop and function in the body. So today he's going to tell you some of the more recent work that he's done around this area. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Gabriel, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. Um, today I would like to discuss with you uh, about the regulation of the innate immunity and more particularly how physiological parameters actually influence the responses of these cells. But before that, I would like to uh, highlight one important discovery in the, immuni in the immunology um, that occurred a few years ago. And for a long time, we had this vision of the innate immune system, of the immune, immune system was divided between myeloid cells and lymphoid cells. Um, and they were um, uh, conferring the adaptive and innate immunity to the organism. And this started with the identifi identification of lymphocytes um, by the French uh, Gabriel Andral and the English uh, William Addison uh, at the first half of the 19th century. Three years later, Paul Ehrlich, um, thanks to a new staining uh, protocol, he could distinguish between myeloid cells and lymphoid cells. And we had to wait almost another century to distinguish between B cells and T cells. Later, Rothstein identified dendritic cells, and a few years later, NK cells were identified. And you can see that for almost 30 years, we had this vision of the immune system. And very exciting, uh, and I think because we don't leave this uh, kind of discovery every, every morning, you can see um, a new, oops, sorry, a new um, immune cell type I've been identified, which, which was non-T and B cell lymphocytes. Today we realize that these cells compose a new family of immune cells. They are called innate lymphoid cells. And they're actually the counterpart, the innate counterpart of what have been described for T cells. And so they have been classified in three main groups, following the same um, distinction we had for T cells. You find in the first group, um, the Tibet expressing ILCs, the well-known NK cells, and this newly subset of ILC1. They uh, secret mainly in T4 and gamma. The second group encompasses the ILC2, which are extremely important for the initiation of type 2 immune responses. Uh, due to the fact that they are important source of innate cytokines, such as uh, uh, for IL-5 and IL-13, sorry and they express high level of GATA3. And finally, the Rogamati expressing ILCs um, express IL-17 and IL-22. And so these cells derive from the same progenitor as other lymphocytes, the B cell and T cell. So in the bone marrow from the common lymphoid progenitor, the CLP, it will give rise to more and more restricted progenitor with, um, with more and more restricted potential uh, progenitors, so first the alpha LP and then the ILCP, which will give rise to all these uh, ILC subsets. And we've pioneered this uh, field with uh, uh, Gabriel Bell's lab, where uh, we contributed to identify this progenitor in the bone marrow, but also um, identify some important immune checkpoints where some transcription factors are actually critical to reach the next developmental stages. And so we identify Enfield 3 as critical transcription factor that allow the emergence of the innate lymphoid lineages within the CLP population. Later, we also identified that TCF7 and ID2 were extremely important to uh, repress the B cell and T cell program 
uh, and also the genes that are um, linked to stem cells. And this repression is important to allow the emergence of the innate lineages. But why did we miss these cells for so long time? Uh, maybe first because they are extremely rare. And the second is, a uh, hypothesis could be that they actually do not reside within tissues that immunologists were used to look at. So they are extremely rare in spleen or lymphoid tissues. The rest then live or reside within the organs at the interface between the uh, environment and the organism. And you can see that the proportion of these cells is different between uh, the, or the, the, the organs, but they uh, basically virtually reside in all these organs. Because they have a very particular profile of, cyt of cytokine profile, sorry, each of these subsets are important to fight um, typical uh, um, uh, threat. So NK cells and ILC1 are important for intracellular bacterial and uh, antiviral responses. And you all know that NK cells are extremely important for antitumoral responses, and the, the role of ILC1 in these antitumoral responses is not yet understood. ILC2 are important for uh, type 2 immune responses, therefore they are important for, to fight against parasites, but they have also been linked to the uh, initiation of uh, allergy. And finally, ILC3s are important for extracellular um, bacteria fighting. But because they reside within these tissues, they are not only important for immune responses, they appear that they are actually also uh, playing a critical role in the homeostasis of these organs itself. And so they are not only important to mediate pathology, but it seems that they are also important to uh, keep the tissue homeostasis uh, during life. And so ILCs need to integrate a lot of signals to mediate their role. And so I distinguish the pathological regulator from the physiological regulator. So they can sense inflammatory mediators, cytokines and alamines, and they are very well equipped to identify these signals. But it seems that these cells are actually also equipped by uh, other receptors that can identify metabolites, neuropeptides, and on the story I will present to you today, uh, also hormones. And this hypothesis started from uh, the observation that males and females are very distinct immune responses. Um, and this is not only observed in humans, it's uh, across many different species, from the drosophila or, or the mouse. And generally, uh, females have a greater and, and better immune response, um, which leads to a faster clearance of the pathogen and better response to vaccine. And when you look at common diseases, the susceptibility between men and women to these diseases are, are, are very different. If you take the example of cancer, uh, excluding sex-specific or breast cancer, uh, males are much more prone to develop cancer. At the opposite, if you look at autoimmune disease, uh, it's very interesting to know that 80% of the patients suffering from uh, autoimmune disease are actually women. A similar observation, but less extended, uh, on asthma, with um, female being more prone to uh, develop asthma. This, this is obviously multifactorial, and so you could imagine that different factor actually, uh, it's an addition or maybe a multiplication of this factor that leads to this disease, but to try to understand what caused this, um, you could uh, identify that behavior, could be one of these factors, obviously. Uh, this might explain why men are more prone to have parasites, because maybe the behavior uh, tends them to explore more environment where they can encounter the parasites. The genetic background is obviously an important uh, factor. You know that uh, X chromosomes uh, bear a lot of immune genes. And uh, uh, today, we're going to focus on, on our attention on hormones. And <clears throat> there is two main hormones that differ between uh, male and women. And when you think about it, um, our cells evolve in very different hormonal environment between men and women. So uh, this is the, the maximum level that you reach uh, through your life of different um, uh, sex steroid hormones. So, sorry, the um, testosterone in males and the estradiol in females. Um, so after a, a, a first burst of um, 
uh, hormones uh, during the, the fetal period, which is actually important for the development of the fetus. Uh, the second phase, the period where you reach also the highest level of hormones uh, in your body is uh, after puberty. And while testosterone will remain uh, through um, men's life, um, the estradiol level will eventually drop in women after menopause. And this is very interesting when you look at asthma prevalence. Um, you can see that after puberty, we have this uh, massive drop in asthma prevalence in, 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 in men, sorry. Well, it's stable in, in women. And so we try to understand this. Um, and so we um, developed, uh, we used um, a model of asthma in mouse to compare the susceptibility between the female and the, and the males. And we used a uh, house dust mite model, which I think is one of the best physiological um, uh, model to, uh, to, uh, for asthma sorry, in mice. Um, so after sensitization, we challenged the mice, and one week after, we looked at the uh, immune, infi immune cell infiltration in the lung. And so you can see that, sorry, um, males uh, uh, seems to be protected to develop asthma compare, when you compare to female, where you have a, a massive recruitment of uh, immune cells uh, we characterized by eosinophil, lymphocyte, macrophage, and neutrophils. And histology also is very striking. Uh, you can see this massive recruitment of immune cells. And asthma is obviously a type 2, uh, type two uh, immune response, um, characterized by uh, the large secretion of IgE by plasma cells and the recruitment of Th2 cells. And this is where the ILC2 are interesting, because this new cell seems to be uh, to have a central role and, and critical role in the initiation and um, the development of asthma. So ILC2 can actually sense the alarming and cytokines that are released by uh, the epithelium once they are irritated by allergens. And in response, IL C2 gets activated and will secrete a massive amount of IL13 and IL5. IL-13 will act on macrophages and will promote the polarization of these macrophages toward M2. It will also directly act on epithelium to promote the mucus production and the hyperplasia of the goblet cells. It will act on dendritic cells to promote their potential to initiate type 2 uh, immune responses. And basically, the uh, dendritic cells will migrate to the lymph nodes, will encounter naive T cells and will promote Th2 responses. And so with IL-5, allowing the recruitment of eosinophil from the blood circulation, all this inflammation leads to bronchial hyperactivity, which is the symptoms of asthma. And so we look at ILC2, uh, sorry, they not only pro promote the inflammation, they're also important in later phase of asthma during, um, for tissue repair by their capacity to uh, secrete amphirigaline. And so we wondered if ILC2 were maybe different between males and females. And so I took uh, um, edge match uh, mice, obviously, and, with, and uh, I analyzed the ILC2 in the lung from the females and the male. And it was very interesting to see. So you can identify ILC2 in the lung by their eye expression of GATA3 and their lack of uh, CD3, CD19, um, so lineage uh, markers. And you can see that uh, both the frequency and the absolute number is dramatically reduced in males. It's interesting also to look at the college one expression, which is a maturation marker for ILC2. It's very di um, different between males and females. And you can better see here on this graph. Um, the frequency of college one positive ILC2 in females is, is dramatically uh, reduced. And it was also true for ST2, which is the IL-33 receptor, but also for IL-25 and IL-22, sorry, uh, IL-2, sorry, uh, receptor. So we had these differences not only in numbers, frequency, uh, but also in the phenotype between the male and the female. And so the next question was trying to understand why we have these uh, uh, differences. And the first hypothesis we had is maybe estrogens are boosting ILC2. Uh, in females, and because estrogen is, is a well-known hormone to, be, to have a pro-inflammatory effect on the immune system. And so to test this, uh, we overectomized the mice, which, um, so re by removing the ovaries, we, we just removed the main source of, of um, female um, hormones. And uh, when adult were mice, we look at the ILC2 in the lung. And if 
um, the oestrogen would boost um, the, uh, the ILC2. In the ovarectomas, we would expect that uh, the uh, ILC2 number reached the male's levels, and it, it didn't happen. Um, whether the, the female were ovarectomized or not, it didn't have any effect on the ILC2. This is in numbers, but also on the, on the phenotype we saw. But what happened when we uh, castrated the males? So we did exactly the same to test if testosterone could have an impact on ILC2. And now, when you compare the males to the females, they are not different anymore. So by removing the testosterone in males, we just um, recapitulate the same phenotype as we see in females. We also wondered if this was uh, an impact on the activity of the LC2, and if he, this could explain that maybe why um, men um, develop less uh, ILC, um, type 2 inflammation. And so to test the activity of the ILC2, we used an IL-33 treatment, which directly targeted the ILC2 in the lung. And this induced a massive proliferation of the ILC2, as you can see here, and also uh, their activation. And so this is the, the control PBS. You can see the, the increase of ILC2 in the lung, which is also observable in males, but it's much less um, uh, than in females or males castrated. And this is summarized here in number and frequency. And so when you look at the activity of the cell, which is basically the IL-5 and IL-30 secretion, um, we see a, a slight increase uh, in terms of uh, frequency of the cell. So uh, intrinsically, the, the cell seems to be also more prone to uh, secret this cytokine. But obviously, the, the major effect is on the absolute number of cells that can secret these cytokines, um, as you can see here. And this is of a direct consequence on the inflammation of the lung. If you look at the histology, um, you, uh, while the male have, um, uh, seems to be like kind of protected, um, you have a, a massive immune infiltration in the females, and you have the same infiltration when the males are castrated. And so this is really link um, the testosterone to the um, um, type 2 susceptibility uh, of uh, females. how testosterone actually mediates its effect on, 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 on ILC2. So we first tried to understand maybe testosterone was increasing the cell death or apoptosis of the ILC2, and it was not the case. We didn't see any differences. We next tested if uh, it could promote their proliferation. And um, <clears throat> we did a KST, KI67 sorry, a staining. And um, impressively, um, the ILC2 from uh, the females were much more uh, proliferating. And so we uh, hypothesize that testosterone is actually inhibiting the proliferation of the ILC2. So we first obviously look at uh, the androgen receptor, which mediate the uh, effect of, of testosterone. And it was very interesting to see that uh, ILC2 were expressing high level of this uh, receptor, while estrogen receptor were not expressed. And it was also very interesting because when we look, we compared with other ILC subsets, only ILC2 were actually expressing the androgen receptor. So how androgen receptor signaling works? Uh, basically, androgen receptors are transcription factors that are ligand-inducible. So uh, the testosterone can diffuse through the membranes and reach the cytosol where the androgen receptors are. The testosterone is converted uh, in dehydrotestosterone, which is the bioactive form which is recognized by the receptor. And the receptor will then dimerize and will then translocate into the nucleus where it can uh, mediate and uh, regulate the gene expression of, of targeted genes. And so you can like, play with this signaling because you don't need a knockout, actually. Because if you don't have the ligand, uh, it's like if you had a knockout because you don't mediate this effect. And so we could test it. We could activate the androgen receptor or block it and see what was happening on the proliferation of the cells. So you can do this with either adding DHT directly into the culture or adding fritamide, which is an antagonist. And so this is what we did. Uh, we, took, we purified ILC2 progenitor from the bone marrow and let them grow uh, and differentiate into mature ILC2 for almost 10 days. And these cells were cultivated either with DHT or fritamide. And it was interesting when we look at the fold expansion of the cells, the cells that um, that were uh, cultivated with DHC uh, were almost not able to proliferate. Uh, and we see this massive reduction of proliferation compared to the control. But interestingly, if you block 
the androgen receptor, you, um, you, you allow the cells to massively proliferate. So definitely here we had the proof that um, the uh, activation of the androgen receptor is uh, important for the proliferation of the ILC2. Right. <clears throat> the next question was, was this relevant to in, in, uh, in vivo? And uh, so we made different cameras, uh, four different cameras actually. Uh, we, the donor were either wild type or androgen receptor knockout cells. And the host were either the, the females or the males. And you can understand here that um, when the host is the female, whether the cells have the androgen receptor or not, it doesn't impact on the ILC2 responses. And this is, you can see, after ILC2 treatment, the inflammation induced, whether the cells are wild type or androgen receptor knockout, we have the same inflammation. But when the cells have the receptor and they are in the male environment, um, here you can see the dramatic differences while the wild type cells were protecting uh, the male to develop these type 2 immune responses, the cells that didn't have this androgen receptor could not. And this is directly linked to the ILC number and abundance in the lung, as you can see here. And so <clears throat> uh, I think we identify another level of uh, ILC regulation, which is the hormonal regulation. So the Estrogen, or sorry, the, the testosterone uh, act directly on the androgen receptor to inhibit the ILC2 proliferation, and maybe also we have to go more detail, but maybe also more directly their function. And this have a direct consequence by inhibiting the type 2 immune responses. What we want to do uh, next is basically identify what are the pathways under the androgen receptor. This could be very interesting. Maybe we're going to identify new critical. Um, the molecules that are involved in the homeostasis of these, tissue, of these cells. We also obviously want to understand if this is actually true in, in humans. Uh, we have good hope that we will be, um, because the observation we, we have between men and women, and women support this, this hypothesis. But we're going to check this um, mainly in human as mice model. And this is done with uh, Nick Huntington, who is developing these mice. And also, I think it would be interesting to try to identify, identify some, which are selective, selective androgen receptor modulator. And this um, small molecule are actually important when you um, <clears throat> want to uh, deliver the effect of testosterone on a particular tissue or particular cells. Because obviously, we don't want to treat women with testosterone and have the effect of testosterone on reproductive tissue, for example. So, this some can selectively uh, target some uh, cells and mediate the androgen effect on these cells. And this is what we want to do. This is already done in clinic. Uh, people uh, suffering from um, muscle generation, uh, women, they, we, they are given uh, some some and to uh, promote the uh, positive effect of testosterone on muscles. And this is also what is done with CERM in uh, breast cancer. The second part of my talk, I would like to discuss about another uh, level of regulation, which is the uh, circadian regulation. And I call this the, the fourth dimension of the immune system, because now we have to take into account the, the time. So what is the circadian rhythm? Uh, <clears throat> it comes from the Latin circadian, which means about, for about a day. And it's all the observation, all the oscillation that you can observe in organism that follows the daily rotation of Earth. And this is because we have two distinct phases. Uh, we have an active and an arresting phase, and this is true for all organisms. And this confer a, a critical evol evolutionary advantage, <coughs> apparently, because uh, circadian rhythm are observed from the cyanobacteria to humans. So it's extremely conserved mechanism. And you can imagine that you are not facing the same threat during your active phase and the resting phase, because obviously when you are active, um, you are, may have more chance to encounter uh, infection and, and injuries. While during the resting phase, it's better for your body to promote the tissue regeneration and um, tissue repair in general. How does this work? Um, so you have um, in your brain um, what we call the central clock. And basically a small number of cells uh, that reside within the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus is directly linked to your retina, which sends the light. 
And this creates the the, this oscillation and, and synchronized um, the clock. And through the endocrine and, and sympathetic pathway, the central clock will um, synchronize the, the rest of the clock that you have in your body. Um, so the rest of the organs are aware about this, uh, this oscillation. And this is through the rhythmic secretion of hormones, such as the well-known you know, melatonin, um, which is important for the sleep, and catecholamine and glucocorticoids. And it's already interesting to, know, to see that these hormones are, are known to have an uh, important impact on the immune system. And so the rhythmicity, the, this different rhythm uh, of secretion of these hormones um, already could have an important impact on the immune response at different time points. You all know the important effect of glucocorticoids, for example, on the, the immunosuppressive effect of glucocorticoids on, on the immune system. But all these clocks um, are actually uh, within every cell of your uh, body. Uh, <clears throat> and they are generated by a group of, co of genes that uh, oscillate and create this oscillation by um, the expression and of, of genes that repress themselves, their expression. So it forms a feedback loop that um, amazingly um, or have been evolutionarily uh, selected to last 24 hours. But they not only control their own expression, they also control the expression of, of a variety of, of genes. And uh, we, it is estimated that all the transcriptome of a cell can vary between 15 to 30 percent. And I even read in some reviews that up to 50 percent of the transcription can vary like this every day. It's interesting because you can see this oscillation in vitro, but because you don't have a central pacemaker, they, just, they are completely unsynchronized. And you can synchronize these cells um, by doing a, a serum shock, um, and you will synchronize this cell for a few times. So this is the, clo uh, the core clock genes. Um, it's mainly composed by um, the initiation of the loop by the two genes, uh, clock and BLM1. This will induce the, the expression of the genes cryptochrome and period that will repress the expression of clock and BLM1. But because one loop is not enough for this system, there is many different loops that uh, allow the oscillation to be uh, very robust. Um, it exists uh, rev alpha, alpha, which is a second loop, and actually it exists a, a third loop involving ID2, a very well-known genes for immunologists. And so you can see that these genes are not only controlling their expression here, but they also control uh, these clock-controlled genes. And um, in line with uh, what is inter interesting for us today, immunology, uh, important genes for, for Im Im immunologists are controlled by these clock genes, such as a clock which uh, induces the expression of nf kappa -B, uh, and a period period uh, 2 actually is an inhibitor of STAT3 expression, and Revbar alpha uh, is an, also an inhibitor of NF3 expression, which is an important transcription factor for ILCs. And so basically all the biological process are following this rhythmic pattern, uh, from your body temperature, your earth rate, or the metabolism, the endocrineal system, and the blood pressure. And so what about the immune system? It's not very an, an explored uh, field in immunology, but um, few studies have studied this, and, and they have all had an, an important impact in the, in, the, um, in the scientific community. Um, basically, the idea uh, is that um, during the resting phase, and, and all, most of these uh, studies have been actually focusing on the migration of the cells, um, the idea is that... Um, during the resting phase, the leukocytes and the immune cells are more uh, in the uh, blood circulation. So they can uh, migrate to the tissue uh, when uh, you are in your active phase and be ready um, to, for the infection. This is very interesting also uh, when you look at circadian rhythm because, um, and, and when you look at particularly uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, if you ask, um, and if you look at the symptom of rheumatoid arthritis, it's not constant. It also follows this rhythmic pattern. And uh, actually, people suffering from rheumatoid arthritis um, have uh, more severe symptoms early in the morning. 
And <clears throat> this is actually correlated to the circadian secretion of IL-6 in the blood. You can see that we all have this circadian regulation. Um, this is, sorry, this is in LC uh, subjects. You have increase uh, early in the morning of IL-6. But obviously, when you look at patients, um, this uh, IL-6 burst is, is much more pronounced. And this directly correlates with the symptom of the malady. And so to treat people, we usually use glucocorticoids. And so the um, prednisone, which is uh, one of these uh, main drugs for this patient, is usually taken between 6 a.m. and 8 a.m., which is during the time where the uh, symptoms are already, um, already appeared and are there at the maximum. But what happens if we just delay uh, the prednisone intake? Then the symptoms are much more or less. And you can see the IL-6 burst in the, the, the serum is also much more reduced. So without uh, any additional cost, um, we just um, improved. Oh, we, I didn't do anything. But these guys uh, I, I, I could, could uh, really uh, improve the uh, patient uh, life uh, by just uh, delaying the, the uh, drug intake. So you can see how it is important to actually understand uh, this circadian regulation of the immune system to um, and to um, improve, improve this uh, treatment. And I think ILC2 could be a very interesting target to um, analyze for second and regulation. Because actually, because they are strategically placed within our tissue, um, they can both mediate um, inflammation and a tissue repair. Um, so they could anticipate um, the uh, pathogen encounter and, uh, during the active time and also promote the tissue repair during the resting time. And the ILC2 can do this uh, perfectly because they can promote inflammation by the secretion of IL-13 and IL-5, but they could at the same time improve the uh, tissue repair by the secretion of amphiregulin. And so I, t I decided to test the uh, second and regulation of ILCs. And to do that, um, I um, analyzed ILC at different time points of the day, and actually the night also. And so we took uh, mice at... Um, oh, I forgot to introduce one important um, notion, which is the Zeitgeber time. Um, uh, when you analyze um, this, uh, when you, you want to understand second and rhythm, you have to have a, a standard way to uh, compare the results. So um, the Zeitgeber time, which means in, in German, uh, time giver, uh, I think, um, is, um, is the, the standardized way to um, um, calculate the time when we, t when we analyze the mice. So ZT0 means the, is the light onset. And in a 12-hour uh, cycle, uh, ZT12 is the light, the light offset. And so uh, when we take a ZT5, so five hours after light onset, uh, or a ZT15. And we analyzed the uh, frequency, the abundance of the ILC2 in the lung. And we saw that the uh, ILC2 pool was actually fluctuating uh, across the day and night. We don't see any difference yet for NK cells, but we are looking also at other tissue and other ILCs. The question was, uh, does this have actually uh, an importance for um, the um, inflammation? And so um, I tried to, to, to test the, the ILC2 function, and I used uh, a papain um, a ch a challenge uh, this mice. So papain is derived from the, the papaya. Uh, and uh, uh, it, induced, it, it induced an inflammation within the lung, which is recognized by the ILC2. And so I, I treated the uh, mice either during the morning or the night, and I analyzed the inflammation in the lung. Um, and you can see that um, this treatment is really, and the inflammation induced by this treatment is really dependent from the ILC2 activity, because um, this is something we published where um, in the NP3 knockout, which doesn't have ILC2, you do not induce the recruitment of eosinophil and the inflammation in the lung. And so after three days of treatment, uh, we analyzed the mice. And it was interesting to see that the mice that have been uh, challenged by the papain during the, the night, so the active phase for the rodent, and <clears throat> had a, a much more or like... A, a, more important inflammation in the lung, with uh, more recruitment of eosinophil, particularly uh, in the lung. 
And so you can see there were true errors in the field because they express high level of uh, sig like f. The next thing was trying to understand if uh, actually this ILC2 has the uh, machinery to mediate a circadian regulation. Because currently it is absolutely not known um, how the different immune cells, do they express these genes, how they are regulated, all the circadian loop are expressed or not. This is something that is absolutely not known. And so um, I purified ILC2 from the lung and uh, I uh, um, analyzed the expression of uh, important genes so for this loop, clock BLM1 and rev alpha. And you can see that uh, these genes actually oscillate. And see, if you draw this oscillation and you imagine that rev alpha will be, uh, will be repressed, the oscillation will be exactly the opposite. And this is what happened, actually. So we have uh, clearly um, the expression and the functional uh, clock um, that is uh, expressed in this ILC2. So it's another level of regulation, another level of physiological regulation of these ILCs. So it seems to be also governed by this circadian rhythm. And I think it's critical to understand how the uh, circadian rhythm can influence the immune responses um, in line with what I show you with um, the rheumatoid arthritis patient. But this is also true for uh, other diseases such as asthma, where the symptoms are also more important during the, um, during the morning. <clears throat> and this could lead to um, have a better optimization of the current treatment and, and vaccine. We would like to uh, better understand, obviously, how the second and regulation of the ILCs uh, occurs and also understand what genes are actually modified by in, in this circadian uh, manner. And so to do this, we're going to do array sequencing, attack sequencing at different time points of the ILCs. Uh, of the day, sorry, in the ILCs. Um, we are also going to try to understand how the genes that compose the molecular uh, uh, clock uh, affect the, um, uh, the development and the function of the ILCs. And we started with um, the BLM1 and Rev alpha, which um, are important genes of this circadian clock, and that are already have been uh, shown to have an uh, important role in, in immunity. And finally, does the circadian clock actually in influence the outcome of uh, inflammation and, and some disease? And so we're going to test this in many different uh, models. Um, we're going to repeat the papain, uh, analyze in citrobacter, which is a gut infection, but also in asthma, because, I also, uh, because um, asthma also, as I told you, has this rhythmic um, uh, expression of, of uh, like symptoms. So I just would like to, to finish by thanking all the people um, that have been involved in this work, and especially the support from Gabriel, um, who um, welcomed me five years ago, and uh, allow me really to, to work on what I, would, uh, I wanted to, to, to like to work. Uh, so especially, as she said, uh, I, was coming, uh, I came to, to work on dendritic cell, but I was so fascinated by these new ILCs that were dis just discovered when I arrived. Uh, and so I think we could do... Um, we'd have done great thing on these things. And I also thank her to give me the freedom to um, do uh, this uh, new research um, now in our lab. Uh, I really want to thank all the members of this lab, which is, uh, which, who really helped us um, uh, to, to perform the experiment, um, etc. And I want to also thank uh, Nick and Tintan, with who we started to collaborate, and, and Sebastian Karokta, who, who was here when I started my, my postdoc. I um, also want to thank really uh, Charlene and Matt Ritchie, with whom we did an uh, important study on the development of the health season. And you might remember the third slide of this talk uh, was summarizing actually uh, five, five years of, of work. And this has been done with, with Charlene and Matt also. Uh, obviously, want to thank everyone in the we are in the um, sorry molecular immunology division, but especially all the people from the uh, we are facility that really help us on an uh, everyday um, basis to perform our experiment, especially the fax facility and the mouse uh, facility. I want to thank the international collaborators such as Eric Vivier, who is uh, really um, helping us on the understanding how ILCs are important in inflammation, and Jean-Charles Guéry, with whom I did um, the ILC2 um, story with, with the hormones. 
obviously thanking um, the fundings, uh, especially the grant and the um, care development fellowship who support my research. Thank you very much for your attention. And further from that, do is there anything known about the differences in humans between male and female circadians? Are there any? So obviously the circadian rhythm uh, regulate the hormone expression. So not sex hormones, but um, other hormones like uh, the melatonin or glucocorticoids or noradrenaline, adrenaline. And all these follow a rhythmic pattern, but it, these patterns are pretty similar between men and, and women. Because um, the, what induces the circadian rhythm is, is the light. One, one of the main entrainer of the circadian rhythm is the light, and so we are all sensitive to light. Two of the most effective <coughs> modern therapies for asthma and arthritis are anti TNF and anti GM CSF. How do they fit with the IL 2 system? Why do they work? Um, so, yeah, the, the, um, this effect on the ILC2 is really on the initiation of the uh, asthma, basically. Um, then we don't really like um, we don't really target the later time point. Um, so I'm not sure about. We measure eosinophil infiltration. Yeah. If that's an early or late, I don't know. Yeah. Any GM CSF will stop that, obviously. Yep. The RC2 somehow <coughs> stimulate GM CSF to activate the essentials. What, what's the relationship? Yeah, I don't know. Um, actually, we, uh, there is no, nothing described between GM CSF expression by ILC2 directly. Um, what is known is that ILC3s actually can uh, promote the uh, GMCSF secretion, which is important for dendritic cell activation. But uh, in the lung, there is no, no such uh, study yet. Um, so I really cannot, um, like, I'm not sure about this, uh, these treatments. I'd like to just ask a question. You showed data uh, when you gave it the pain uh, to the mice at night. That would be their most active period. So how would that translate to humans? When, when should vaccines be given or things like that? Yeah, so the thing is that um, it appears that uh, <clears throat> in this kind of disease where we have a circadian regulation, um, if we better understand when um, these uh, pro-inflammatory uh, mediators are secreted or maybe uh, when the cells are more prone to, to secrete these uh, inflammatory mediators, um, if we better understand that when the when this actually occurs, we can try to anticipate this and better treat before the burst of cytokines, like the IL-6 in the case of rheumatoid arthritis, but maybe uh, IL-5 or IL-13 for IL-C2, and so we could treat uh, we, like we could do a, a chrono, um, uh, pharmaco uh, chronology um, to um, um, yeah determine what is the best time to uh, provide the, the drug and stem for vaccine, like having the best uh, vaccine responses. So, I'm just curious about the male and female differences. Have uh, you looked at different strains, just to make sure it's not just vaccines? So we didn't for this particular study, um, but uh, the differences are observed in, in, in a different background. Um, so, uh, for example, um, it is very well known that, uh, so you know that lupus is very different between a male and female, and so on different uh, lupus-prone uh, uh, background um, mice, these uh, sex differences are, are also observed and conserved. Yep. So, uh, conventional T cells are also very important in the asthma response, and that model you mentioned. Were you able to disentangle in vivo the contribution of androgen receptors between ILCs and the conventional? Yeah, so we um, mainly focus on the LC2, obviously, and, and um, we basically um, use early time point to try to really understand if it was actually um, 
targeting, like the effect we saw was targeting the ILC2. The, 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 the other thing is that we are also, um, so we have this in vitro experiment where we actually show that it's direct effect on the ILC2, which is, um, I, we, we didn't test it if uh, T cells uh, would also uh, um, rep uh, like, yeah, reply to this uh, stimulation. But, No more questions, and I'll just ask you to join. Thank you, Cyril, for a great seminar.